Hello and welcome back to the show. So I am super excited to be sitting here with my guest today, Noel. Noel is a real estate investor who started really his real estate journey back during the last recession uh, in 2008. And we're going to be digging all uh, into that and his story and how he became an investor in a time where I think a lot of uh, people will think it's not a good time to be in real estate when Noel has proved all those people wrong. And he has been super successful and it's been in over a hundred real estate transactions in the United States and abroad. So without further ado, I want to welcome to my show, Noel. Noel, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. You know, it's it's real. I, I love the topics and I love talking real estate. I love talking investing. So I, I'm just ready to dive in. That's awesome, man. I love your energy. So before we get into anything, uh, at all, would you mind just, we do this with all our guests here, uh, sharing a little bit about your backstory and uh, how you got into real estate. What was it that got you out of your, your traditional job into real estate and uh, how has that journey been for you? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go back. I, um, I'm i a uh, former pro athlete, you know, former scientist and now full-time investor. Oh. Um, I got into real estate basically when I look at it, I thought it was that being laid off during the Great Recession. So it's actually 2009, post-2008 Beijing games. But it was a little bit further, I would say, and I always like to talk to people about limited beliefs. You know, I um, I got back from the 2008 Beijing games. I didn't make the team uh, by my, I guess, literally where I meddled or anything of that nature. Um, but I still, you know, I was chosen by the United States Olympic Committee to help guide run for a blind person that was a Paralympian. And um, I was I was still young at the time. And I was like, oh, I'm going to you know, try another run for myself at the 2012 London Games. And, you know, my dad and stepmom were like, what are you going to do with your life? You didn't make the 2018. What are you going to do? I was 26 years old. I was so young. And I realized it was their limited beliefs and actually fear that they had for me. It was still love, but it was the fear. And they placed that on me. And I was like, all right, guess, guess, all right, let me shelve this. You know, I was in peak shape. Let me shelve this and let me use my degree. I had a degree in biology at the time. And I went to work at GSK in GlaxoSmithKline. And literally less than like a year later, I get called to this big room and I get laid off. And I'm like, what? the hell is this you know this is not the plan and all I can remember was you know it wasn't just you know a, a department or you know you know you have certain layoffs where they're just kind of downsizing they shut down the whole building and so uh, anybody's from North Carolina that's in that research triangle park section I don't know if you remember it looks like the beehive building it was called the Alliance Hitchens building back in 2009 it was completely shut down and I remember the looks on the, my peers and colleagues' faces, and I was like, I don't want to feel that way. And they had children, they had husbands and wives to support. You know, I'm still 20, I was like, still, I was about to turn 27. I'm still young. I didn't have, I think I was like crashing on somebody's couch at that time. You know, I, I you know, that was, I was kind of like still with my bros. So we weren't like, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have any responsibilities, meaning that. And I seen the faces on folks, and I was like, I never wanted anyone to have that type of power over me you know and it's that wasn't that I didn't like science I just thought like man somebody that's getting paid probably quadruple or everybody's salary in here is this making that decision and they're going to be fine they're still going to be good and everybody else's lives are impacted and so I got really angry I was like how do the rich get rich oh you know I'm up there on the keyboard how do the rich get rich <laughs> And, and I realized, you know, like 90% of people were uh, from real estate. And that's what started my journey on real estate. And I talk about now, I laugh at this, it's another funny situation, I laugh at it. I was so frugal, you know, that I'm still kind of frugal now, but I was very frugal now, I laugh at this. I would go to the Barnes and Noble section, and I would just take notes in the real estate section, because I was laid off already. So I had time. So I would just go to Barnes and Noble's and I would just go ahead and, you know, bookmark it, place it back in and come back every day. And I would take notes and it could be like real estate for dummies. It was all types. The Gary Keller's book. 
I was just reading as much real estate and just immersing myself in it. And I laughed now. I was like, why did I just buy the books? You know, I just, I still had the notebooks, but I was like, I could have bought that. It might be that Seinfeld commercial where George Costanza was going in Barnes and Nobles and with the books, I kind of laugh at that now <laughs> about that. But um, I, I did that for a number of times. I was kind of self-taught. And um, I think back then it was a lot harder because real estate wasn't sexy. You know, the crash just happened. It was it was not as sexy as it is right now where everybody is, you know, pushing it. And what I started doing was um, going kind of, I started off with auctions um, and not in the sense that I was going to the auctions. I would Google, but not to Google, you can look at any like uh, sheriff sale and see what's coming to auction. So say that right now we are in, uh, we're in September. If we're in September. I will look for what's coming to auction in January, you know, or December. And I would go to that door, to go to the doors and knock on their doors. So I was going door to doors on the neighborhoods that I felt that were, and it, it's kind of funny. I didn't even know anything about location at the time. I was like, oh, this seems like nice. So that, that was my only criteria. I didn't know the crime. I didn't know the rents in that area. You know, I look, because those are the things I look for now. I was like, oh, this looks like a nice area. I like this zip code. I'll try this out right here. And I was going door to door. And that was another life lesson because I was an asshole uh, in a sense where, you know, I wasn't talking to people uh, improperly or inappropriately. I lacked the empathy to know that these individuals were losing their homes and no one wants to lose their home, whether it's tax or mortgage foreclosure. You know, and it was like it was a selfishness on me because I'm like, I, I need the property, I need properties. Um, but you know, and I, it was just all sell, 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 you know, and pitch, pitch, pitch. And I'm like, man, and I look back at it, it was this no empathy. And what changed out of that that outcome was that I would ask the you know, the homeowner now, like, hey, one, how can I help you? What what's the issue? How can I help you? Number two, how can we partner together? Or number three, we depart and you know you have your free coffee. At that time, I wasn't doing Starbucks. I think I was re meeting at like McDonald's and having like the little coffees at McDonald's. You know, this is 2009, 10. So I know I wasn't doing, Star I don't even think Starbucks was on this side at that time. I think they might've been in, still in Seattle, but I know <laughs> I wasn't going to Starbucks. It was definitely like McDonald's or like mom and pop, like coffee shops. And I would I would never talk business at the, um, well, I learned not to talk business at the, at the door, you know, ringing people's doorbells. And particularly I was doing it on Sundays because I was, you know, I'm a big metrics guy. And I was like, man, most people were home on Sundays. They weren't home on Saturdays. And Sundays, yes, you have a high rate of answer, but also people are like getting ready for the week. They literally don't want to be bothered with anything. And then certainly if that burden is on them, they definitely don't want me like, buy me some of your house. <laughs> you know, I didn't have no pitch, but other than, Hey, I seen your property on for sale and going to auction. You better sell it to me. It was totally inappropriate. So I had to learn, you know, tactfulness, empathy, and that, uh, you know, really led me into where I'm at right now. So I, I kind of some of the pillars that I still use today when I locate properties right now, I still use that tactfulness first. How can I help you? You know, if I can help my seller and uh, and really listen to the needs of the seller, I think it always like really, it makes for a better uh, you know, business. And I, I think really from 2014, 15 to about 19, I would say 80% of the properties that I was closing on came from referrals. It, you know, and these weren't all like, these weren't like foreclosures, but I was using that approach of helping people and they referred me to their friends and people that were also kind of saying, hey, I'm, I'm looking to get out of this property or I have an issue. And about 75, 80 percent of, you know, the properties that I purchased was because of, of that. That's, that's a great story, man. I think that's awesome that you, uh, you know, you kind of came from the, uh, the background of an athlete. Um, I think there's a there's a yeah. lot of very successful people who are in business that came from that background as well. Um, just simply because they're able to take a lot of the, uh, you know, the things that they're learning from their training and repetition and putting it towards, you know, their success in business as well. And I love what you're talking about there as far as helping the sellers um, solve a problem rather than just kind of going uh, going over to their house and, you know, telling them, hey, you got to sell it to me, uh, you know, or, or else, right? So yeah. talking a little bit about, you know, 
the time period, the time frame that you started getting into real estate, uh, 2008, 2009. I mean, obviously looking back now, everybody's like, oh man, I wish I would have gotten into real estate back then. But at the time it wasn't definitely wasn't like that. So what was the mindset there? Was there a lot of uncertainty on your end and the people around you? It's like, why are you getting into real estate or were you just kind of, you knew and you were just going to go after it? I knew I was getting after it. I knew I knew what I wanted to do, and I'm very um, hard headed and bull headed until I get the result that I wanted. You know, and I always tell people I was door knocking um, for eighteen to thirty six months. You know, you know until something successful happened. You know, and I was still doing other things in parallel because I got a I got a um, a seller financing deal uh, within that, but. My first deal from like door knocking and doing that was like 36 months after I started. And I just kept at it. And actually the funny story that I still keep this contract. My, when I got my first yes, I wasn't prepared because I heard so many no's and I quickly went home and Googled stuff from like Arizona state law. I was like, oh, this sounds good. Throw that in there. Oh, this sounds good. Throw that in there and gave this contract. I, I, I still look at it because I'm like, oh man, this could have blown up so bad because I was just Googling and putting stuff together and I just didn't know any better. So if you're listening out there, always have a lawyer draw you up a correct, uh, you know, a contract. But I laugh at it. I still keep it and laugh at it because that's my first one. But I think what, what really helped me was that I was ignorant to what was really going on. I under I knew about the Great Recession and like what was happening, but I didn't know I didn't know that that my first interest rate that I had was eleven percent. I didn't know that was high because I didn't have anybody to bounce that off of. So when I did my first, uh, you know, I did a seller financing uh, owner financing deal, so same thing, and um, I had to end up refining it out. And I didn't know about borrowing at that time. I just went to the bank, used my W-2, and it's got a straight loan. I had a ton of equity left in it, but I didn't know anything about that at that time. Like, oh, I could have got the money that I bought to, you know, the closing back in some. I just was like, oh, I just need a straight loan. They, the credit union gave it to me. I was like, great. And I had a highest interest rate. I was like, well, all right. I still made, I was still profiting. Um, wait, and, and I, oh man, damn, that's a, that's a good segue into something else. So this, I'm gonna hold that thought. Uh, <laughs> but I was still profiting, but I didn't know any better. I think now that it's so prevalent and social media outlets are just like in your, in your face with it. And it places a lot of fear on people. And what I would say is that be very methodical on your numbers. Don't be scared to invest, but I would say be very methodical on does it make sense because there's deals out there's there's deals out there a lot of them don't make sense but you can still find quality deals if you kind of keep your nose to the ground and uh, you know one of my other phrases is always quality over quantity i was never in the one of like oh i have this many doors if you don't net net anything i'm always looking over quality over quantity that you know i you know i was always buying at um 60 55 to 60 percent and the reason I was doing that, and that was buying and rehabbing. And the reason I was doing that, because I was like, well, if the bank is only going to lend me at, you know, 70%, you know, because like, and I was like, well, I need to get that other money back. And I learned that over time. So I was like, well, I need to buy something at this price and then be able to rehab it at that price. And, you know, I had to learn those type of things over time. And so, yes, my, my, my pond and my net, my fishing area is a lot smaller but the quality of deals got a lot better for my cash flow. And that was really important for, for me. Absolutely. I, I think a lot of investors, especially newer investors, miss that point, right? There's a lot of eagerness to kind of get into the game. And there seems to be a lot of mistakes being made. And I think I, I you know, when I talk to a lot of investors who've kind of made it or been in the game for a while, they always say that, you know, that first deal is so important because, if you have a bad experience with your first deal and you lose like $50,000, you're probably not going to pursue real estate, at least for a very long time. Long time. You'll, you'll be burned. And um, I just want to hold that thought about the, uh, the profit, what I was saying when I was profiting. Uh, that was something I had to learn too as well because I was in pharma. I was still, I was making good money. I was always making, you know, around like low six figures. 
and I didn't know how to run the business properly. So I was like co-mingling money and I wasn't setting aside money for escrow for like taxes, insurance. And I had to learn that over time. So, you know, now I can see like videos of people telling this. I, I really learned by just bumping my head and getting these bills. I was like, wait a minute. It's not, it wasn't included in my, my, my P&I. I'm like, wait a minute, I got to pay th this? And I had things in the county. And so you had to, you know, the outside in the county for, I'm in, based in Philadelphia. So Philadelphia County, you only pay one tax. It's just your real estate tax and, uh, you know, everything's included. But I had things that are outside of Philadelphia and you have to pay your municipal tax. You have to pay a city tax. You have a school tax. I had a sewage and rubbish tax. And I was like, Man, the schools aren't even good in this. I, like, I wanted to audit the education. I'm like, why is this school tax so damn high? Like, we need to audit what you guys are teaching because, like, who, who, where's this money going to, <laughs> you know? And so I had to understand to run it like a business. Um, and I, I would tell any new investor, you know, run it like a business. I have a, um, a cash flow sheet that I always use and I give it to like new investors because it's not what you gross, it's what you net. And you need to understand all your debts, make sure you have some reserves. Even if you don't, I always recommend like if you're in your W-2, hire a property management company. I know, you know, some people are like, well, it's only one property I can self-manage. Well, yes, if you're going to self-manage, still pay yourself seven to eight, 10%, pay yourself a, you know, a, a allotment for that. But I always say, you know, and I always tell my, my investors that are like white collar folks that want to, you know, get into this, treat it as a passive income. So get a, get a, get a property management company. And before you buy the building, let's go through this worksheet and see what you're actually going to net after you pay, you know, your reserves. I a lot, you know, I always tell them to keep 3% for your reserves, keep 5% for your vacancy. If like it's not vacant, still place it in there, you know, have, you know, common for a, a, a single, it might be 10%. Set aside 10% for your property management. Let's see what you net right now. You know, let's see what you net. And if that's, you know, sufficient, guess what? That's passive income coming into you every month. And let's, you know, let's keep your account separate. Let's get this LLC, like run it like a business. And that way, when you're doing your schedule ease, it's so, it, cause like, these are like, I give them real life scenarios, not scenarios. I actually, I share my information. Like, look at what my taxes were right here. I was totally, one, I was trying to do my taxes with real estate properties and TurboTax. Big red flag. No, 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 do not do that. You know, that was me, but like, oh, being too smart for school. I'm like, you know what? I'm not paying anybody to do this. I'll do the turbo tax. Yes, you can do that. But, you know, finding someone that actually, you know, is aligned with what your goals are and a, a competent CPA goes a long way. You know, I, I always tell people to think long term. And you can really have that, like the past income gain and gain if you, if you follow it, you know, methodically. Yeah. Lots of unpack there. And I think there's a lot of good stuff that you just <laughs> said as well. Um, first of all, obviously you got to be methodical with your numbers, right? And this is so important for investors, especially newer ones who are getting in the game because you can't, you know, it's, it's good that, you know, people are passionate about real estate, but you can't tie up so much of your emotion into it where you're not looking at your numbers correctly. And then the second piece of it is, you know, having all the infrastructure set up, almost like having the business systems at least understood, if not set up before even going in there and, and kind of making your first move. So what would your, would that be your advice as well? Um, I know kind of you started out, right? There's a lot of mistakes that you made, but there's a, I guess the question is, there's this balance between, you know, taking action and analysis paralysis and just not doing anything. But where where is that balance for you right now, if you were to go back and start over? Yeah, so you know, when I I have I have, I have mentees that I do bring in, and um, I always tell I do I, I'm really big on the methodical on the numbers and making sure that you're not fudging because you can make math, you know, if you, especially if you're emotionally attached. And I always try to tell them like, don't get emotionally attached. Make sure the math is mathing. You know, do not try to skew it to make it make sense to you. You know. Because you'll end up burning yourself. And then I also teach them like the exit strategy. So I never, I don't buy buildings unless I have an exit strategy. So I already know what bank I'm going to before I buy this property. And I, I'm talking to the bankers. I'm like, hey, do you guys have an appetite 
for this type of property in this type of area. You know, I'm talking to my insurance, you know, my broker for my insurance. And so I allow them to say, hey, these are your team members that you need to actually be speaking with and, you know, and talking with right now to make sure this is the correct buy. And once these have this, you know, the checklist, boom, 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 go ahead and go. Yep, <clears throat> absolutely. You want to make sure everything is in place, right? Especially if you're going, um, I know there's a lot of investors these days who are very, uh, they're, they're very, with a very popular strategy, the birth strategy, right? With the refinancing and a big issue that I think a lot of people run into and the mistakes that they're making with people not being successful is that they don't have the refinance set up or they're miscalculating the numbers and they're getting only half of what they expected. And then that tanks the entire operation. Yeah. Or they didn't know what, like the seasoning on the bank, you know, uh, you know, how are they getting their money? Is it their money? Or are they buying hard money? Um, then also, if you have to look at it right now, burring now is a lot different than when I was burring in 2016 and 17 because of the interest rate and what your debt service coverage, your DSCR debt service coverage ratio will be, uh, you know, so you need that. That's another thing that I'm, I'm always, you know, mindful of and pressing like, Hey, once you refi this, can, can, can the rents cover your debt service? Can everything cover your debt service and you can still profit, you know? If not, and it's not meeting that criteria, no, walk away, don't do it because you'll end up either bringing money to, to the closing, you'd be like, oh my God, what happened? You know, also ask the bank, you know, am I locked in on that rate when I do my application or actually when it's going to closing? Those are two separate things because everybody's aware Fed rates will go up and down. So you want to see like, when is that rate locked in? How long? Some days, sometimes they only lock it in for 45 days. So you need to kind of understand like, what's, what's the appetite when I always say the appetite, your appetite of that bank that you're going to. Right. And seasoning, if everybody seasoning means like how long have you owned the building? Normally there are certain banks that want you to own the building for uh, longer than a year before they'll allow you to uh, refi it out. There's other ones that'll say, hey, I want the tenants in there longer than a year. Then you have other ones that say, hey, three, six months. It's, uh, you know, you have to go, each one has a different appetite. Right. Absolutely. Making sure you have everything in place before before moving forward. Right. And it takes a lot of discipline, I think, for um, for anybody to be successful in real estate investing, because it is such a very capital intensive, but it also, um, you know, it, it, it's very detailed as far as the numbers you need to know, right? It's not something where you can, um, you know, like you were just saying, where you can fudge the numbers a little bit because it makes you feel better or makes you feel like you can get into the deal. Um, so it takes a lot of discipline in that sense. And do you think that's something that it's, you know, investors need to be able to develop before they even get started? Or is this something that you kind of, as you do more deals, you get more discipline or do you actually get less disciplined? Uh no, no, you, you know, definitely don't want to get less discipline and you need to have that discipline before going, <laughs> going in, you need to have that discipline going in. Um, I think it, 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 it allows you, um, want not to, um, make sure you're not, um, being, I always use the word emotional, but it makes sure that you're not, uh, reaching for the fences on a project that, you know, really doesn't make sense because, you want to deal, you know, you know, stick to your criteria. It also helps you right now knowing how to run the business, you know, how much, you know, what I always teach is that, all right, once you have the property, you have the X strategy, you know that you're going to net, you want to stabilize the property to stabilize. Now, how are you going to get the next one? What's the plan from that money that you're allocating from that property passively now to build to the next one? You know, because I always tell people like, um, well, this is one of my pet peeves on social media is that people look down on people because they work a W-2. And I'm like, what? when did they, when did having a W-2 become uncool, you know, to work? You know, like I loved my job. I just outgrew it. You know, that was the only part. Like, and I, I didn't leave my my full time job till 2017 because I just outgrew it, you know, and, you know, and I was vertically integrated with my property management within my own my own team. So I, I grew it. But your W-2 is really your first partner. You know, you can leverage that with so many banks to give you to get, give you your your and, and then technically the bank is your second partner because you're bringing a portion of the money and they're bringing the rest of it. So, you know, they're your partners in this. So I always tell people have the discipline to be the financial literacy and to um, 
I don't want to say respect money because, you know, but to, to know how to earn money can earn you more money. And that's a, that's an art of discipline to have as well. You know, I, I had a luxury of my uncle um, informing me, I was, I was still young. I probably, this is my second job after I got laid off and I was getting a raise and he was like, Hey, you're getting this raise right now. Don't, don't change your standard of living. The squirrel, squirrel that money away to invest. And um, he always gives this story about how he could have invested in this telecommunications um, uh, uh, investment, you know, back in the 80s, I think he was always saying. And he's like, do you know what that telecommunications was? And I was like, what? He was like, Sprint. <laughs> and I hear these like he always laughs. He's always like, you know, so this squirrel your money and then make sure when you're doing your investments, you know, you, you strike, you strike on it, you know, you know, do risk mitigation. But he's like, you're not dumb, you know, do risk mitigation, but keep your standard of living and is put that money away so it can it can earn more money. You know, so he taught me a lot about the compound interest and things of that nature. And, you know, that's something that I do now. I have a 15 uh, month old. So I buy properties for my son now. So he has 11 units right now. And from those 11 units, what I do is that that rental income now goes into a custodian account at Mass Mutual. So you can get a custodian account called a UT, you have UTMA and UT uh, GA, GMA. And that money that's in there now gets invested into the SP500 index fund. So I allow compound interest to work its magic for my son in that one. Uh, he'll have rights to that. So I just pound that and then he'll have access to the properties. So I always tell like, I'm not doing a 529. I'm just buying him three to five properties a year. So by the time he's 18, he can have his choice. They'll be free and clear. He'll have a, a ton of properties. So he can go ahead and if I'm teaching him right, he may say, hey, you know what? I'm going to sell two, you know, you know, and one will be for education. The other one, I may buy something near the campus and, you know, rent some repeat of what I, you know, taught him. But, you know, that's my strategy. So there, there's options out there. And those are one of the things that I always like to uh, teach people outside of real estate is that I love real estate. It's one of my favorite investment tools, but I don't just do real estate. I, I still invest in the stock market, you know, I still, you know, things of that nature. But I do love a hard asset as far as like bricks and bones and land. I still I still love that. Right. Absolutely. And I think that's a, you know, it's really interesting that you brought that up because I think uh, the stock market or at least investing in the stock market gets a really bad rep, uh, especially yeah. in the real estate investors uh, community, right? They're it's like, undefeated. don't invest in the yeah. stock market. <laughs> right. Like what? No, it's undefeated. Like, you know, it goes up and down, but history has shown us that compound interest. I mean, it's amazing. Like, come on. Yeah, absolutely. So I love that you have that opinion as well, that you're 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 willing to diversify and you're willing to tell people to diversify as well in that because you're absolutely right. You you never know what's gonna happen. The market's always, you know, always changing and you always want to have different options to put your money in and see how it's working and, and get different ways for your money to work for you rather than you kind of going out there and working for money as well. So I I like that that you have that opinion. Yeah, because yeah, you can't predict you can't break predict cycles you only can do as much risk mitigation as you can like no one predicted COVID you know COVID I doggy paddled through that with my I'm in a tenant friendly city you know um I, I love the fact I was talking to you previously uh offline that you know I have a 20 unit in Harris County and it was like a three days pay and vacate you know and you know I can get once I get in there I can get tenants out there not paying but Philadelphia is not that way you know if someone's not paying first you have to go in front of a uh a diversion course and renegotiate, you know, their rent in the diversion court and put them on a payment plan for them breaking already their lease. And that takes, you know, months to get the front of them while you're still not getting paid. And then if they break that again, you can go back again and see like, hey, how can they do another agreement? So that's months in there. So it's almost like a year, maybe 13, 14 months where you can get someone out in Philadelphia sometimes. So it's really, you have to really know how to pick your, I uh, always kind of teach that too, how to pick your tenant base um, and your asset class and how to um, become battle tested, you know, and um, I like to teach us that I'm not here to help you avoid mistakes because I think mistakes are needed because they do propel you and, you know, 
you know, you just don't want to be making the same mistakes over and over again, because that means that's a processy issue that you have. You know, I just like to kind of give like, hey, this is that insight that I have on contractors. I don't, I don't, I don't deal with contractors that have messy trucks because if their truck, something that owned is really messy, how do you think they're going to treat my property? Yeah, you know, I always look like, hey, how do you pay your contractor? I always use Amex, so my contractors need to be able to take Stripe or some type of other electronic payment because, hey, if guess what, if they don't do something, I can call Amex like, hey take this portion back because they didn't do it. So there's this rules of engagement of being battle tested and, you know, and, and going through some of the crap that you go on real estate to, um, to, to really propel you. You know, I always say real estate is easy. People are not. And those are most of your issues that you have in real estate are people issues. Real estate is relatively easy, but it's the people that you're dealing with from real estate that makes it sometimes difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. I think for any business that... <laughs> Pretty much can be said as well. It's always the people that make it difficult, but it's also what, you know, is learning how to deal with people in a, in a, and that's what you did in the beginning as well, as you talk to sellers and develop more empathy is how, how to deal with people in a respectful way, but also not letting them run you over um, as well. And that's what really kind of, I think is the most important skill of an entrepreneur in real estate yeah. and any other industry as well, because as you do more, you know, do more and grow in your business, you're going to start leading a team and then there's more issues that can come up. So understanding how to communicate properly and get to your desired result is so important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, awesome, man. So you mentioned COVID a little bit. I do want to kind of touch on that a little, uh, a little bit as far as how you were able to, um, you know, really work around that because there's so many listeners uh, of this, of the show anywhere in the United States um, and a big question that you kind of brought up or a big issue there is, you know, investing in certain states that are um, tenant friendly versus ones that are more landlord friendly. And there's many investors who are kind of getting up to a certain point or, or even in the beginning of their investing careers where they can invest out of state if they live in a super high price point prop, uh, uh, part of the uh, country or if they're just kind of in a, in, a, in a city or state that's not very landlord friendly at all. So what is your advice to that? I mean, you're obviously still investing in, in Philadelphia, even with some of the issues that can arise there. So are you, I mean, looking to diversify there or you should, should somebody just kind of stay within their area and then move into maybe investing and picking their markets? No, I, I definitely pick my market. I still invest in Philadelphia, um, but out of, out of COVID, that did uh, grow for me to go into a uh, landlord friendly state. So I do have investments in Texas and Houston and in Lubbock, Texas. I also have uh, properties in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and also uh, in Marietta, Georgia. Uh, but to go back onto the COVID, um, COVID was, was rough. Um, I always say I doggy paddle through there. So uh, the, the way I, what it, what it changed was uh, strategy and I had to implement some new kind of like bylaws for tenants. Um, I think I was more lean in my leases where I was like, oh, you have to, I think I had to have to day 15 where you can, you can, you can, um, you can pay. So now, and I would say like rents not due, is rent is due between the first and the fifth. Uh, now what I would do is say rent is due on the first. If you're after the first, it's late, you know, and then, but then also there's another part of culture that I place in there because sometimes you have tenants and you need to understand the frequency of their payment. So, you know, talking, you know, having a management company, because I actually, I haven't leased a, a property in a long time, but instructing, you know, your, your property managers to say, Hey, when you're getting their pay stubs and you're, 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 you're checking their employment history and their current employer, you can ask them, guess what? What is your payment schedule? Or like when you know, because mostly most everybody works at W2. You always get that calendar year. I know I received it all the time. It has that calendar with the little blocks. You know what what days are paydays. You get excited when you get that three one in a month. You're like, yo, yeah, I get three, three, three times getting paid here. And I, you know, so you ask them, like, hey, this is where you're getting paid. And most of the times so they're splitting it up. So we know you're getting paid on this Friday. Does it make sense to start your payments on the beginning of the month for right here so we can ensure that you're making your payments on time? Because it, it doesn't make sense, you know, it, we like the we like to always think like everybody has the financial competency that you have or that we have sometimes. 
and that it's not that it's not true, you know. So what I've what I've learned is to know, like, guess what? And I said, like, why the hell aren't they doing that? You know, I would never do that. Well, they're not me. They don't have, you know, everybody comes from different backgrounds. Everybody is taught different. So I can't expect people to uh, view or look at their finances like I was looking at them. So I'm already going to assume that any tenant I have is going to live paycheck to paycheck. Bam, that's the that's the bare minimum. They're going to live paycheck to paycheck. So I always tell my property managers, that's how you should take it and see like when those payment schedules are on there so payments can be made. And that made a world of a difference on on-time payments when you, when you placed it there. And you're still going to have your, um, I like to say like your anomalies and you know the folks that are just going to be your assholes that they may look good on paper and something happens, you know, uh, or, you know, they're just assholes, you know, normally sometimes something happens. Like, I don't, I don't really don't think no one deliberately wants to pay their rent. Although COVID, I had about four or five people that was like, guess what? I'm taking advantage of this free money. And guess what? The city gave it to me and I'm not giving it to you. And there was nothing I could do about it. I was just like, I had to charge to the game and this, this weight, it, it's going to happen. There's always going to be a margin of error with within that number. That, you know, I call it the shrinkage. You know, in retail they have shrinkage numbers. I call it a shrinkage number in real estate. Like you always want to keep your economic occupancy above, you know, eighty about ninety five percent, and your physical occupancy above ninety five percent. Those are my metrics. You know, if they if they fall below that, if my economic and my physical uh, occupancy is not aligning, then I'm always looking at, guess what, what, what am I doing wrong? I'm always looking like, what am I doing wrong to address and lead my property management company? And, and for those out there, the physical occupancy are, is, you know, people that are just in the building, not paying and economic occupancy or people in the building that are paying, you know, so that's just the difference of the metrics that I'm always looking at. Um, so I learned that from there, but I still invest in Philadelphia heavily. Um, I said I, I have new build, new ground construction, so I'm going to be doing a, um, hopefully it gets approved, but it's going to be like a 45 unit apartment building um, built uh, from the ground up. I have another seven unit and a six unit, and I still do some small stuff for my son where, you know, there's still re rehabilitations that I have. Um, I do some mentee stuff because I get so much deal flow. I can't do it myself, so I'll, I normally give those deals and vet them through my mentees and give them to them, and I'll give them, like, the lenders if they don't have it or the bankers. Everybody that I use, I just kind of give them access to that, so I'm still doing that with them, And but I also teach them how to vet your tenants properly, how to develop a good culture uh, in your building. You know, it, it goes a long way when people feel like they're more than just a um, – a cash cow. So I'm learning to understand what religions there are, what birthdays, what they celebrate. It's just, it's free to send an e-card to say, hey, or you know, this is hey, we're thinking of you. Here you go. This you know, it's simple, but it makes people feel special. And as you, we should treat people that way. That's you know, it, it shouldn't be a ploy, but we should always give that type of respect to people as as human beings, you know. And so I try to incorporate that type of you know, culture uh, in my buildings and even in my like rough neighborhoods that I have, I do the same thing. You know, um, I, I keep people out there that I pay for like, like maybe it's a rough area where they're always placing trash on the ground. I, I keep people out there making sure they're cleaning every morning play, and, and have people see it. Like, I don't want them to be done early in the morning. I want it to be done where time where people are seeing them clean up and True enough, I'm a big metrics guy. I keep metrics on this. It worked. People started seeing with the trash cans and they stopped throwing it on the ground and they placed it in the trash can because they're seeing people cleaning up. And it takes a while, but they'll get to that rhythm of that. Um, I think I diverged from the original question about how, how did I navigate with, with COVID and uh, do I still invest right there in tenant, pla in tenant placement? Um, but one of the things I do is big on culture. I changed my leases. So, you know, I'm making my leases more specified to their payment schedules, things of that nature there. Um, and for those, uh, I still do the first sometimes, but normally it's always aligned to their payment schedule. And that has had a real high success rate.
that's a really good piece of advice, I think, for, and it's a really good principle that you just paint it there because you are basically giving and showing people more respect for who they are and how they're programmed and how, how they live their life and, and, you know, how they have to manage their money, but you're doing it out of respect for them to make their life easier, but you're also getting the desired result that you're getting, right? So I think it's a, it's a very, it's a very important principle for people to understand that just because you're, you know, you can be quote unquote lenient with people as far as helping them make their life easier while also getting the a better result that you want as well. So it's not a, 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 a you know, one or the others that you can do both, right? You just have to get creative like you, like you've done and, you know, getting people to, you know, out there on the properties to help them pick up trash as well. And just kind of showing them appealing to everybody's good side, if you will, um, to get to the desired result you want. So I think that's a very, very important point that you painted there. So yeah. Yeah. absolutely, man. So Noel, I appreciate you being here today. I want to respect your time. I know you're super busy. So for our listeners today who liked what you said and got a lot of value out of what you had to share with us, which is a lot um, what are some of the best places that they can either follow you, learn more about what you do, or potentially even get into uh, your, your mentees program as an investor? Uh, I can be found uh, at uh, Noel Parnell on LinkedIn. Um, I'm right there. Uh, my email address is noel at crown, C-R-O-W-N, capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L, uh, corp, C-O-R-P dot com. Uh, from there, if you're, it's a it's a year long curriculum for the mentee program. Um, I do have a certain criteria because I don't. It's not. It's it's kind of my way to giving back, um, but I don't like to uh, have a saturated because I think it waters down what the message is for 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 the mentees. So, um, but reach out to me and we can discuss and things of that nature as well. Um, I also, if you liked anything about the. Uh, cash flow sheet i can send it to you to give out to anybody or the uh, i have a sheet called a, a mayo sheet it's called a maximum allowable offer worksheet that um helps you kind of predict like what you should your starting bid for be a property and what your max should be for a property i can hand that to you as well those are great resources that i've used uh time in and, and time out i still use it in my mind now i don't really go to the worksheet as much but in my mind i still use it constantly Oh, absolutely. We'll make sure to leave all the links to that in the description and the show notes down below. So that way it's easy for you guys to find Noel and uh, help support him as well. Uh, but other than that, Noel, I want to thank you again for being here. I know you're super busy. And so I want to thank you for taking the time for uh, sharing your value with us here today. Before we let you sign off, is there any last pieces of advice or any last tips you want to leave with us here? Yes. A um, few of them. Uh... A good book that I've always had is uh, read is Who Not How. You know, sometimes we're always like, how do we have to do something? I love Who Not How book. Um, and another piece of advice is never accept a no from someone that doesn't have the power to tell you yes. Because there's always going to be a bunch of no's, but never accept a no for someone that doesn't have the power to tell you yes. So leave it with that. That's awesome, man. Well, thank you again, Noel, for being here. And I want to thank you for tuning in. And we will see you guys on the next show. Take care. Thank you, guys.